friends, at the, uh, at the risk of breaking up some great uh, and joyous uh, introductions here, uh, it is time for us to start. I am very glad to welcome all of you here today. My name is Spencer Fluman, and I'm the Executive Director of the Neil A. Maxwell Institute for Religious Scholarship here at Brigham Young University. The Maxwell Institute, along with the BYU Department of History and the Africana Studies Program here at BYU, are co-sponsors of today's event. And we welcome all of you here for what should be a memorable and wonderful time together. It's customary at uh, BYU for auspicious events like this uh, to begin with a word of prayer. And so we've asked Dr. Ignacio Garcia, uh, Red Professor of History here at BYU, to open our event today uh, with prayer. Father, how grateful we are for this opportunity to meet here as individuals, as scholars, as those who are interested and those who have been impacted by the priesthood revelation. Help us, Father, to learn, to understand. Help us to be inspired and motivated, to be instructed. But particularly help us to, to know the things that we need to know about this incredible moment in the life of the church that it may allow us to look within ourselves and think about all the things that we don't always understand, that we can't articulate, that often trouble us. Help us, Father, to have thy spirit, to be able to see the importance of events like this here at the Y, that they may help our students, help ourselves, that we truly become a place of learning and one in which we learn the right things, the important things uh, in our lives, and that we may be able to go out and truly serve with a greater understanding of, of thy work and, and the things that occur. Help us to understand adversities. Help us to understand the complicated history that is part of our reality and existence in this world. Father, bless the, the panelists, bless all those who participate, participate, and bless those of us who will listen. And we ask these things in the name of thy Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Garcia, for that prayer. <laughs> Professors Leslie Hatfield, Matthew Mason, and I represent the three units uh, that are co-sponsoring today's event. We jointly express our gratitude to our speakers, some of whom have come a very long way to be with us here today. We are so grateful for the efforts of all those who will participate in this conference and have made it a reality. We're grateful to the Maxwell Institute staff as well, who have uh, worked tirelessly uh, to uh, pull this off. Um, they, are, uh, they are wearing name tags like mine. You who are speakers here, if, if, you, uh, if you need to, uh, find one of our staff members if you need anything today at all. Uh, Blair Hodge is over here, raise your hand, Blair. Sandra Shirtliff here, Soraya is somewhere in the back. If you need anything at all, uh, ask any of us. We're happy to help, we're eager to help. We're grateful to the BYU administration and the many others who have helped make this conference a reality. We welcome the entire campus community here today and the broader community as well. We hope you're all enriched by your experience with us. We note too that it's BYU Homecoming Week, so we hope that some of the BYU Homecoming crowd who are here for the other festivities trickle in today and uh, go kooks. The title of our conference today is 40 Years Commemorating the 1978 Priesthood and Temple Revelation. Ours is an academic conference in the sense that it takes up questions that occupy scholars in several fields. Some of the perspectives shared today will use academic tools to examine our topic and convey findings in academic language. But we realize that for many people speaking 
And for many of you in the audience, this is emphatically not an academic exercise only. Accordingly, some of the speakers today will layer academic concerns with personal or religious ones. That is by design. In the end, I suspect that narrative and experience will figure today as centrally as argument and evidence. Perhaps as much as any topic in Latter-day Saint history, ours today proves William Faulkner's truism, quote, the past is never dead. It's not even past. The past and present bleed together when we consider the 1978 revelation. History and theology bleed together here, too. There is hardly a way for Latter-day Saints to consider this history without a broader set of questions and commitments in mind, from scripture, to revelation, to authority, to charity, to reconciliation, to justice, and the list goes on. As a result, today's conference makes no attempt to pull these things apart. While not all of our participants and attendees today are Latter-day Saints, and we welcome those of you who are not, I suspect that each of us here will sense in our own way the overlapping worlds of heart and mind, of word and spirit, of faith and reason, all working together here. So, in this conference, we wrestle with history and theology, with past and present and future. We wrestle with inequity, with mystery, with covenant promises, and with what future we want and how to get there. As organizers, we ask for your patience with perspectives that may challenge you. We ask for your generosity, for views that are new. In some ways, candidly, we intend this conference as a religious act, one of deep listening and grace. We ask you to consider that the person sitting next to you may experience this history and these questions quite differently than you do. Regardless of your perspective, heavy theological questions attach themselves to this history. All the more reason for generosity today. And certainly let's note that we bear these questions unequally. Saints of color often cannot consider these questions as mere abstractions but as burdens present in virtually every religious setting. As one BYU student of color said to me recently, simply, it's exhausting. There are good things to come. In June's B1 event, President Russell M. Nelson sounded the aspirational hope that undergirds this conference. Quote, ultimately we realize that, the, that only the comprehension of the true fatherhood of God can bring full appreciation of the true brotherhood of men and true sisterhood of women. That understanding inspires us with passionate desire to build bridges of cooperation instead of walls of segregation." End quote. A month earlier, speaking in a joint press conference with NAACP officials in Salt Lake City, President Nelson said this, quote, "...today in unity with such capable and impressive leaders as the national officials of the NAACP, we are impressed to call on people of this nation and indeed the entire world to demonstrate greater civility, racial and ethnic harmony, and mutual respect. And then this past July, one month after the B1 event, Elder Jack N. Gerard became the first Latter-day Saint General Authority to address the NAACP National Convention in San Antonio. He told the thousands gathered there that as a church we, quote, envision joint NAACP and LDS activities and projects, including through our National Just Serve program all over the nation. We do not intend to be a flash in the pan. That is not our style, and we know it's not yours." End quote. So, for scholars and non-academic Latter-day Saints alike, the lives and stories of saints of color are becoming easier to access and better known. The University of Utah's Century of Black Mormons project gathers into a single database every known black Latter-day Saint from 1830 to 1930. Paul Reeve has spearheaded that. We'll hear from him later in this very session. 
at the Church History Library in Salt Lake City. Taryn Mitchell and others have assembled an important research guide for those seeking records and information related to African American Latter-day Saint experience in the church's archives. I've asked Taryn to say a few words about that here this morning. Taryn, where are you? There she is. at the Church History Library. I'm also working on becoming the subject matter expert for blacks in the church. Um, I was some years ago, or some time ago, I went to our director and I asked what we could do as the church to help celebrate the commemoration of the 40th anniversary. And one of the ideas that we came up with was creating a, a research guide to help people um, learn more about the resources that we have about blacks at the Church History Library and also to give a background and, and a history of the of, of membership in, uh, within the church. Um, so I, I have our, our landing page up on the screen and the research guide is just right here and you can click on it. Um, in making this research guide, it broke our research guide mold. So we're currently trying to figure out the best way to present it. So not all the information is up here. I submitted a 30 page timeline of events that coincide with what was happening in the church at the time with blacks with what was happening with uh, blacks all around the world. And so we're trying to figure out the best way to put that up online. And this is going to be a living document. So as we get more collections and such, um, we will be adding to this document. And uh, so if while you're doing your research, and you, this document will always be changing. Um, I wanted to create this so that people would realize that um, there are other blacks in the church um, besides Jane Ann and James and uh, Greenplate who, who did great things such as uh, Joseph T. Ball Jr. and Lewis K. Walker. And just <coughs> to give people more resources and, and different ideas of, of the contributions that have been given to the church by blacks. Thank you. Taryn, thank you very much. Uh, with groundbreaking work such as this at the University of Utah and the Church History Library, Brigham Young University, other places, both scholarship and the stories of saints of color will play a larger and larger role in Latter-day Saint life going forward. I'm very excited to note, too, in what turns out to be a very happy coincidence that a fantastic movie depicting part of the story of Jane Elizabeth Mann and James, an early African-American convert to the church, titled Jane and Emma, releases this very day in local theaters. Please buy tickets on your phone now. I'm serious, I'll wait. Someone needs to buy a ticket right now. It's gonna get awkward. There are all sorts of reasons to buy tickets for this great movie. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints Foundation and the Bonneville Charitable Foundation just yesterday announced that they'll make matching donations of up to $40,000 to the NAACP based on your ticket purchases, so get going. Please buy tickets even if you can't see the movie. It's a great uh, coincidence with uh, coinciding with our conference today. So now we turn our attention to this opening session. This opening session engages the history prior to 1978 as a way of getting us to be thinking about the Revelation's varied meanings. I begin with a sad note, actually. Our planned first speaker, Dr. Sylvester Johnson of Virginia Tech University, was not able, is not able to join with us today. Weather disruptions uh, related to Hurricane Matthew in his neck of the woods, spoiled his connecting flight, and we regret that he'll be missing the conference. We'll certainly regret uh, not hearing from him today. So today, we'll hear first from Janan Graham Russell. Janan is a doctoral student at Harvard University. Her research interests currently center on conversion and acculturation among Haitian Latter-day Saints in South Boston emphasizing the role of aesthetics in developing contemporary theological narratives on race and gender. Her work has been featured in two books, Mormon Feminism, Essential Writings, published by Oxford in 2015, and a Book of Mormons, Latter-day Saints 
on a modern day Zion, published in 2015. Her work's also been featured in The Atlantic, online, and in the Deseret News. She also serves as a founding member of the Black Latter-day Saint Legacy Committee, a group of Black Latter-day Saint women dedicated to recognizing the history, present, and future of black members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. This past year, the group organized a two-day conference, The Legacy of Black LDS Pioneers, a celebration for all in Washington, D.C., and a one-day conference, The Legacy of Black Pioneers Building Zion in Sandy, Utah. At the conclusion of her remarks, we'll invite forward Dr. Paul Reeve. Paul's the, the Simmons Professor of Mormon Studies at the University of Utah, where he teaches courses on Utah history, Mormon history, and the history of the U.S. West. His book, Religion of a Different Color, Race and the Mormon Struggle for Whiteness, received three Best Book Awards. His digital database that I just mentioned, to identify all known black Mormons between 1830 and 1930 is now live at centuryofblackmormons.org. After those two presentations, we'll invite forward Dr. Lerone Martin to provide a response to their work. Dr. Martin is Associate Professor of Religion and Politics at the John C. Danforth Center on Religion and Politics at Washington University in St. Louis. He is the author of the award-winning Preaching on Wax, the Phonograph and the Making of Modern African-American Religion, published by NYU Press in 2014. In support of his research, Dr. Martin has received a number of nationally recognized fellowships, including those from the National Endowment for the Humanities, the American Council of Learned Societies, the Woodrow Wilson National Fellowship Foundation, and the Louisville Institute for the Study of American Religion. His commentary and writing have been featured in the New York Times, the Boston Globe, the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, as well as CNN. He is currently writing a book on the relationship between religion and national security in U.S. history. That work will be published by Princeton University Press. We'll have time for a Q&A session after uh, Dr. Martin's response. I'll moderate that segment. At the appropriate time, I'll ask those with questions uh, to come forward to a mic that will be located here in this aisle to my right. And I'll ask that those who come to ask questions, please state your question in the form of a question. <laughs> please check yourself that it is in fact a question. Please be brief. Please give the microphone to the usher or facilitator when you've asked your question. And please feel free to follow up with any of the panelists afterwards if you want further dialogue to give time for, for other folks to ask questions. We apologize in advance if time does not permit us to get to everyone's question. Hopefully you all grabbed a uh, program as well. This will be the first of three sessions today. We invite you to those. And now would you join me with a round of applause to welcome Janan Grand Russell forward. Church's official stance 
is that it does not condone racism. We continue to see examples of individual members reciting racist folklore, and as Jim Durrumpel the second wrote in March 2017, while Mormons have rejected Trump's brand of conservatism, thanks in large part to the president's more controversial positions, Ila's comments represent a growing Mormon subculture that embraces the old right, at times openly cheering white nationalism and intertwining ultra-conservative ideology with Mormon history, culture, and scripture. In August 2017, I co-wrote an op-ed with my advisor, David Holland, on the LDS Church's response to the use of Latter-day Saint theology to promote white supremacy and quote-unquote white culture. That op-ed acts as the point of, my depart a point of departure for this paper. In this paper, I build a theory of race in Mormon theology informed by 19th and early 20th century debates on matter and materiality to provoke a conversation on the less perceptible ways in which race exists within the latter day saint imaginary. If there is no such thing as immaterial matter, how does that impact theological discussions on identity? If God is, as then prophet president Joseph Smith Jr. once stated, like yourselves in all the person, image, and very form as a man, how does that impact God's portrayal in the Latter-day Saint imaginary? I contend that the material properties of the blood carry socio-political and theological implications for the development and conception of God in Mormonism. I analyze these implications through the lens of the law of the conservation of matter, that matter cannot be, that matter can neither, uh, oh, sorry, that matter can be neither created nor destroyed. When individuals theorize God as being made of not only flesh, but white flesh specifically, that imagery suggests that whiteness is eternal. I'd love to contribute to the discussion by examining race and the politics of the blood in the, Jesus, in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in terms of their relationship to intellectual and theological revelations on materiality. My argument is not that God or Jesus the Christ promotes whiteness or white nationalist ideologies, at the same time, there are certain racial politics of the blood, theology, language, and matter that have yet to be explored in depth within the context of contemporary Mormonism. When an individual uses Latter-day Saint theology and history to support white nationalism, it's valid and necessary to question their interpretation. At the same time, have we ever asked ourselves, what race, what is race within a Latter-day Saint context? This article builds from the inside out. First, for the purpose of time constraints, because I can talk a lot about matter, trust me, I spent a lot of time on this. Um, I provide a brief overview of material cosmology and Mormonism. There, I survey dialogues on matter and the materiality of God in the mid 19th to early 20th centuries. Because of these dialogues, constructions of God emerge from the 19th century in ways that differ from those referenced in other Christian onto theologies. Descriptions of God's countenance and character that were previously abstract are now rendered concrete. Within a Latter-day Saint theological context, the word, emphasis on the lowercase w, blood and matter, are interdependent. I suggest a matter of blood that implicates the model of models of theophysics advanced by Joseph Smith, Orson Pratt, Charlie P. Pratt, Brigham Young, B. H. Roberts, Johnny Whitstow, and James E. Talmadge and the role these models play in the construction of race and Mormonism. Theophysics is a field of study that interrogates theories and theologies related to the physical universe that was created by God. In using this lens, I hope to speak to the curse of Cain and why the matter of blood within a Latter-day Saint framework makes it difficult to extricate the nexus between purity white skin and sin dark skin. The way in which these thought leaders assigned meaning to, the matter, to matter and blood informs a deeper analysis. Blood is not apolitical, and that similar to the flesh, it is infused with what Hortense Spillers describes as culture-specific culture conceptions of being human. To borrow, if you will, Michel Foucault's description of the relationship between the body and soul, I offer that the body is the prisoner of the blood. I submitted an epistemology of the blood that contributes to Latter-day Saint interpretations of the relationship to the tribe of Ephraim and to Christ. Thus, I assign it the theophysics label. Stated differently, 
I posit that there is a correlation in these dialogues between matter, blood, and race. It is one that ascribes intermittability to race as a fact of existence. As blood is transmutable, and I highlight this later in, my, uh, in a later section of my paper, so too can race, race change, such as the belief was held that the skin color of Native Americans would become lighter as they increased their proximity to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lastly, I suggest an alternative vision for the meanings of blood using an op-ed piece written by myself and David Holland in response to the LDS Church's statement about white supremacy and white culture in 2017. I locate my work across the fields of material studies, physics, theology, and critical race theory. It should be noted that this is a working theory that I, look to, uh, hope, I, that I hope to develop further. My goal is, however, to, to develop an alternative method for approaching critical race studies in Mormon, contemporary Mormonism. One that engages Mormonism's racial history, not as a single process, but rather as a set of social, scientific, and theological processes entangled in notions of being. One can trace contemporary dialogues of race in the flesh within Latter-day Latter Saint theology, the intellectual history of its early leaders specifically to theological discourses on matter and the materiality of God and Christ. Joseph Smith's theology of materiality is a bricolage of his contact with American religious movements in the burned over district, as well, as well as revelation and conversations strewn across his adult years. Also known as the Psychic Highway, the western bound region of New York State attracted groups such as the Campbellites, Spiritualists, Spiritualists, and Quakers, among others. Smith would have no doubt been exposed to concepts regarding the substance of being. In Doctrine and Covenants 131.7, Smith confesses that there is no such thing as material matter. In his King Fall at Discourse, Smith dis declares that the principle, pure principles of element, which he describes as chaotic matter, are principles which can, can never be destroyed. They may be organized and reorganized, but not destroyed. He never produced a comprehensive theology on the subject, and Elliot's church leaders continued to develop it for several years after his death in 1844. Orson Pratt and Carly P. Pratt set the foundation for the further study of matter, materiality, and the onto theology of God and Christ. In his 1849 treatise, The Absurdity of uh, Immaterialism, Orson Pratt gives an exhaustive account of material cosmology arguing for the physical basis of Mormon cosmology. His philosophies engage the work of Galileo, Laplace, Newton, and Descartes, among others. In one section, Pratt expounds upon Smith's premise that an immaterial substance cannot exist. Space is boundless, he argues, and as such, all substances are contained therein. He interweaves discourses on time and space to supplement his greater narrative on the existence of matter. He argues that space can be, be divided by points, and that points, uh, between points, uh, there's time, and that an instant is where the duration or time begins and terminates. He follows the definition of matter that proves to be significant, and, and that he defines it as something that occupies space between any two instants. It suggests that matter has a distinct purpose, which he alluded, alluded upon uh, throughout his essay. It also suggests that matter has bounds, or laws from which it works. God, he surmises, is comprised of these parts. Pratt believes God's composition differs from other types of matter, making God's entire being unknowable. However, he also states that God's person is comparable to the sort of matter that is perceptible. The substance of his person occupies the same, occupies space the same as other matter. It has solidity, length, breadth, and thickness, like all other matter Pratt writes. Pratt admits that God is a spirit, but argues that the premise of an immaterial being is contradictory. Immateriality is another name for nothing, he adds, a statement that lends itself to my later discussion on the materiality of race. His brother, Carly P. Pratt, invested in the work of material cosmology, building on the idea of God's person being, in fact, the same species of man. Carly's, perhaps most recognized work on materiality and matter, can be found in his 1845 article, Materiality. Pratt begins, God the Father is material, Jesus Christ is material, angels are material, spirits are material, men are material. From the late 19th into the 20th centuries, LDS church leaders continued to develop Mormon cosmology centered on the impact of matter. 
Matter, whatever it is, John Woodstow writes, is eternal, however, a principle of the highest theological value. Woodstow again points to the indestructibility of matter in his treatise Joseph Smith as scientist, a contribution to Mormon philosophy, as foundational to modern science. Joseph Gilded Smith in 1936 explains, some of our writers have endeavored to explain what an intelligence is, but to do so is futile, for we have never been given any insight into this matter beyond what the Lord has fragmentarily revealed. We know, however, that there is something called intelligence which has always existed. It is the real eternal part of man, which was not created or made. This intelligence combined with the spirit constitutes a spiritual identity or individual. James E. Talmadge, author of Jesus the Christ, opines on the relationship between the permanence and transmutability of existence in the Articles of Faith, a series of lectures on the principal doctrines of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. While existence is eternal, he, he writes, and therefore to being there was never a beginning, there will uh, never be an end in a relative sense. Each stage, of, each stage of organization must have had a beginning and to every phase of existence as manifested in each of the countless orders and classes of created things, there was a first, and there will be a last. Other LDS church leaders theorized on intelligence and intelligences, plural, <laughs> as a constant in the universe. Harold B. Lee points to an intelligence that was crafted in the spirit. Uh, Roberts draws a line between immaterial matter and immaterial substance. He suggests that qualities and attributes such as grace, mercy, justice, and truth may be matter, however, existing beyond our sensory capabilities. LDS Church prophet, President Spencer W. Kimball noted, our spirit matters was eternal and coexistent with God, but it was organizing the spirit bodies by our Heavenly Father. This section is only a brief overview of discourses on matter and materiality among 19th century LDS church leaders. Considerations of matter and materiality of God by the various LDS church leaders over the span of 120 years held the role of opening Mormon cosmology, uh, opening up Mormon cos cosmology that could explain God's existence. At the same time, these discourses opened up the possibility of a theology that assumed that identity, and specifically race, was an eternal substance. Prevailing narratives on the topic of race within Mormonism focus on the assemblage of theological, social, political, and scientific thought. Latter-day Saints stood at the crossroads of shifting perceptions of whiteness and masculinity. Quote, the European or white race of men has never been polygamous before, wrote Professor C.G. Forshe, Forshe, a prominent late 19th century science writer. The white race was created manifestly for a higher destiny, an instinctive abhorrence of the brutality and promiscuous intercourse is impressed upon the males and especially the females of the race. In an attempt to shed their otherness, Latter-day Saints in the 19th and 20th centuries took on a narrative that considered Latter-day Saint cosmology, British Israeli Israelism, and Anglo-Saxon triumphalism and determined race as blood. In the United States, the one-drop rule dominated America's socio-political landscape. Several states enacted one-drop laws into their constitutions. In Florida, Section 2 of Acts and Resolution, Resolutions of the General Assembly of the State of Florida stated that one-eighth or more of Negro blood shall, deemed in, shall be deemed and held to be a person of color. Blood determined one's personal political status. The, status, the secret of success lay not in the institutions but in the blood rights Kelly Brown Douglas. This carried theological implications. The association between lineage and blood within a theological context has deep roots in American religious history. Increase Mather, a prominent minister in the Massachusetts Bay Colony, proclaimed in 1667, the providence of God has suffered other nations to have their blood mixed very much. As you know, it is with our own nation. There is a mixture of British, Roman, Saxon, Danish, and Norman blood. But as for the body of the Jewish nation, it is far otherwise. His sentiments echoed predominant notions of the purity of Jewish ancestry, undergirding later associations between the purity of Jewish ancestry and physical features. Quote, well well-marked uh, uh, Israel, uh, Israel, sorry, uh, features are never beheld out of that race. Josiah no rights in the types of mankind. The complexion might be bleached or tanned, but the Jewish features stand unalterably through all climates. 
Latter-day Saint religious leaders inadvertently produced an ethnic identity that authenticated their claims to an Israelite heritage by differentiating themselves from Gentiles. Receiving the Holy Spirit, Smith claimed, provoked a spiritual and physical transformation, purging out of, a purging out of the old blood of the Gentiles and replacing it with the blood of Abraham. If the spirit can rebel, writes Orson Whitney, surely blood can, even the blood of Israel, in forsaking its first love, turn away from the God of, uh, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You understand who we are, Brigham Young writes. We are the house of Israel, of the royal seed, of the royal blood. In comparing this statement to his comments that, that, the most, that most of the Anglo-Saxon races will be of the blood of Israel, one may observe an unfolding narrative that binds blood and race. Race in Young's narrative becomes matter via the blood. When Young pronounced that no person having the least particle of Negro blood can hold a priesthood, his words rendered the restrictions into the socio-theological and social scientific. In a way it hadn't before, black as a state of existence was implicated in Mormon's, Mormonism's cosmic narrative. The attitude of the church with reference to Negroes rights to the First Presidency in 1949 remains as it has always stood. It is not a matter of direct commandment of the Lord on which is founded the doctrine of the church from the days of its organization. 20, 20 years later, a letter published in the Improvement Era, a magazine for young men in the LDS faith, David O. David McKay and his two counselors, Hugh B. Brown and Elvin Tanner, commented on the status of members of the LDS Church. The seeming discrimination by the church towards the Negro, uh, they explain, is not something that originated with man, but goes back into the beginning with God. After years of speculation about the origins of the priesthood and temple restrictions, growth of the LDS Church in Brazil and Africa, and deliber deliberation among its counselors, LDS Church prophet president, president Spencer W. Kimball pronounced in 1978, that the revelation, by revelation, the Lord has confirmed that the long promised day has come when every faithful, worthy man of the church may receive the holy priesthood with power to exercise its divine authority and enjoy with his loved ones every blessing that flows therefrom, including the blessings of the temple. Accordingly, all worthy members of the church may be ordained to the priesthood without regard for race or color. Shortly after the priesthood announcement, a number of Latter-day Saint affiliated hospitals in Utah arranged to accept blood from consolidated blood services for the Intermountain region. Today, the LDS Church's official stance concerning the previous restrictions is that there are no clear insights into the origins of this practice. For Brigham Young and various LDS Church proper presidents and leaders, race was absolute. It personified more than one skin color, like other forms of matter, eternity was inscribed into every, uh, characters on every particle, every character on every particle. It was a statement of righteousness and character. White and Latter-day Saint theology symbolized purity, a purity that manifested in one's countenance and flesh, while white, black, and dark have been reinterpreted to signify, one, signify one's character. The period of time in which these associations were made alongside the nature of the association between words and material objects make it difficult to fully divest the white purity and dark skin dualities. These imaginings made their way into the flesh of God and Jesus the Christ. Switching gears, I return to Robert's discourse on grace, mercy, justice, and truth, and thinking about blood, matter, and race in Mormonism. Specifically, his definition of the terms as matter, albeit less perceptible, and how that can be applied to adapting the theophysics of Mormonism to a set of liberatory practices. Race matters in all senses of the term. I'm weary of the theory of colorblindness because of its ability to privilege those who are able to ignore race. Instead, I want to counter the theophysics of race in Mormonism with an alternative theology to the matter of blood, using the theme of continuing revelation uh, from the Deseret News op-ed piece by myself and David Holland. The capacity for the pursuit of grace, truth, mercy, and justice is ingrained in LDS theology. It was almost stated, and now, as ye are desirous to come unto the fold of God, as he called his people, and are willing to bear one another's burdens, that they may be light, yea, and are willing to mourn with those that mourn, yea, and comfort those that stand 
in need of comfort, and to stand as witnesses of God at all times and all things and all the places that ye may be in. Latter-day Saints often refer to the atonement in our testimonies of Jesus the Christ. However, what aspects of the atonement are we talking about? What did that reconciliation require? The atonement is the most poignant example of grace, mercy, truth, and justice, and was revealed through Christ's death and resurrection. It is in that the blood of Christ contains these things. When we see images of Christ in Latter-day Saint art, we never see him in his most vulnerable form, beaten, bloodied, and in immense pain. At the same time, one reads a profuse expression of grace, mercy, justice, and truth. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Today, you will be with me in paradise. Behold your son, behold your mother. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I thirst. It is finished. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. When one partakes of the blood of Christ every Sunday, one symbolically for a small instant is altered becoming one with the body of Christ and the body of the church. Just as the body can be imprisoned by the blood, the body can also be freed by the blood of Christ. As Gordon B. Hinckley once wrote, may the Lord bless us to work unitedly to remove from our hearts and drive from our society all elements of hatred, bigotry, racism, and other divisive words and actions. The tools to dismantle all elements of hatred, bigotry, and racism are there. They've always been there, never created nor destroyed. The essential doctrine of living revelation, the Abdan reads, holds that God can and does continually speak in order to bring his children toward an ever clearer understanding of his mind, will, and heart. While I continue to wrestle with the implications of an eternal existence of marked difference, the application of the law of the conservation of matter contextualizes possibilities for an alternative future. On the indestructibility of matter, B. H. Robert proposed, B. H. Roberts proposed let it be noted that the definite amount of matter has not been annihilated, but merely changed into something else, namely into energy, radiant energy. With that, I close with the last paragraph from the op-ed. The Book of Mormon opens with racialized identities, but its prophetic narrative pushes towards a beautiful climax in which those separations cease. Likewise, the church in this dispensation has its history with racial divisions, but, as with the other divine plot lines before it, its trajectory points unmistakably to a future when such things shall be overcome. Thank you. Thank you to Spencer and the Maxwell Institute for the invitation and to my fellow panelists. It's an honor to be with you today. <clears throat> Edward Strutt Abdi, a British official on tour of the United States in 1833 and 1834, was interested in prison reform and in observing the American penal system. <clears throat> in the process, Abdi became interested in much more than American prisons. Upon his return to Britain, he published a three-volume and wide-ranging tome of his visit. In it, he reported on the rise of a new religious sect in America, the Church of Christ, whose members were more commonly called Mormonites or Mormons. Abdi noted that he did not have a chance to visit a Latter-day Saint community or meet with Latter-day Saints in person, but he did hear reports about them and did read from the Book of Mormon, their new book of scripture. From what Abdi could glean, the Latter-day Saints were open in their attitude toward those with whom they interacted. In fact, Abdi pointed to this very openness as one potential source of tension between the Latter-day Saints and broader American society. He noted that Ohio Saints honored, quote, the natural equality of mankind without accepting the Native Indians or the African race. Abdi pointed to a specific verse in the Book of Mormon for further evidence of his assessment, especially its lofty ideal that all are alike unto God, including black and white, bond and free, male and female, and heathen, Jew and Gentile. With such an expansive vision articulated in the Latter-day Scripture, it was no wonder that they were persecuted, Abdi wrote. 
In his mind, the Book of Mormon ideal that all are alike unto God, including black and white, made it unlikely that the saints would remain unmolested in the state of Missouri. As Abby sought, the perception that Mormons were too inclusive earned them fear and scorn in a national culture that favored exclusion, segregation, and even extermination of undesirable races. Massachusetts Governor and Latter-day Saints, us, uh, there we go. Uh, Massachusetts Governor and Latter-day Saint Mitt Romney's bid for the White House in 2012 revealed the near polar opposite racial problem for Mormonism in the 21st century. This is uh, an op-ed that Lee Siegel wrote for the New York Times, calling Romney the whitest white man to run for president in recent memory. Uh, all of our presidents, except for President Obama, have been white, but Romney's Mormonism made him the whitest. So in moments of rich historical irony, rather than not white enough, Latter-day Saints in the 21st century were perceived as too white. Understanding the arc of that story, from not white enough to too white, helps us understand how it was that in 1831, Joseph Smith could receive a divine mandate to preach his gospel message unto every creature. And yet, by 1920, the LDS First Presidency could argue that our mission is not directly to the Negro race. It also helps us to understand why it was that in 1978, Spencer W. Kimball, then prophet and president of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, needed a revelation on racial matters in the first place. Kimball's 1978 revelation began the long and slow process of overturning 126 years of racialized policies, teachings, and practices. An assessment of that long and slow process 40 years later is what brings us together today. In the fluid and illogical racial context of 19th century America, Latter-day Saints were forced to fight for more, than their, for more than religious tolerance. They had to fight for their status as American citizens, a battle that found them grasping for higher and higher rungs on the American racial ladder, even as Protestant white Americans attempted to push them back down with that same ladder. As I see it, the Latter-day Saint racial story has far less to do with supposedly divine curses than it has to do with the power of whiteness in American history. In fact, in telling the Mormon racial story, one ultimately tells the American racial story, and that American racial story is founded on the intoxicating principle of white supremacy. In this regard, the broader American racial context is crucial to understanding Mormonism's internal racial story. For example, Abdi was not the only person in the 19th century who found Mormonism too inclusive. Numerous allegations leveled against the Mormons complained that they accepted a variety of unacceptable people. Outsiders variously suggested that the Mormons had, quote, open an asylum for rogues and vagabonds and free blacks, that they embraced all nations and colors, that they maintained communion with the Indians, and that they walked out with colored women. That they, were welcome, that they welcomed all classes and characters, and that they received aliens by birth as well as people from different parts of the world into their communities and congregations. At least initially, Mormons embraced an open racial vision in the face of this opposition. Two well-documented black men were ordained to the face highest priesthood, and Mormon missionaries cast a white net, gathering black slaves, white slave masters, free blacks, abolitionists, and anti-abolitionists into the Latter-day Saint gospel fold. That very openness, however, led to opposition. When John C. Bennett, one time confidant of Joseph Smith Jr. and influential Latter-day Saint in Nauvoo, left the faith, he turned enemy to the saints. His 1842 expose expressed a growing sentiment designed to racialize the Latter-day Saints and call their whiteness into question. He told his readers of the Latter-day Saints' plan to one day return to Jackson County, Missouri, and redeem their Zion. It was to be a future gathering place for all the saints, and in that delightful and healthy country, they expect to find their Eden and build the new Jerusalem. It was a religious vision that was too much for the embittered Bennett to stomach. Quote, Joe had better take another look through his peepstone, Bennett wrote, because the Lord intended that white folks, and not Mormons, shall possess that goodly land. In Bennett's description, Mormons were not white and as such were not entitled to the blessings of whiteness, in this case, the land of Missouri. By the mid-1840s, as outsiders made a case for the Latter-day Saint expulsion from Illinois, the descriptions of Latter-day Saints morphed into that of a distinct Mormon race. 
And by the 1860s, those descriptions grew to include imagined physical distinctions. Quote, a striking uniformity in facial expression, which included a albuminous and gelatinous types of constitution and physical confirmation among the younger portion of Mormons, which characterized a new race. At the same time that outsiders racialize Latter-day Saints, Saints themselves imagine racial identities for others. They participated in the same racial culture which denigrated them, but turned their focus upon other marginalized groups, especially African Americans and Native Americans, in their own quest for whiteness. Latter-day Saints reinforced their ideas with scripture and prophetic proclamations, which led them to believe that black and red skin were divine curses. Those curses, however, carried starkly different paths toward redemption. Indians, as fallen descendants of ancient Israel, were subject to racial uplift, people who, following conversion, could become white and delightsome. In contrast, Mormons eventually imagined black people as beyond the redemptive power of their gospel plan, people who bore the mark of Cain and therefore fell outside of the great chain of being, a cosmological web which bound the human family together, leading back to Father Adam. People of black African descent were welcomed into membership in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and even worshipped from 1830 to the 21st century in mostly integrated but sometimes segregated congregations. But they were eventually barred from its priesthood and the full saving rites of temple worship. Mormons thus sought to bring Native Americans with them on their journey toward whiteness while they left people of black African descent behind, casualties of the Mormon struggle for whiteness. Whiteness, after all, was measured in distance from blackness, and Latter-day Saints moved increasingly across the course of the 19th century towards segregated priesthood and temples and away from their own black members. In a nutshell, this is how I have come to understand the Latter-day Saint racial story. It is a story that cannot be divorced from the fraught American racial context within which it was born. That context offers a compelling explanation and helps me to understand how Mormonism eventually passed as white by the beginning of the 20th century and thereafter became known in public perception as a white church. As much as this explanation helps me to understand the Latter-day Saint racial story, I want to use the rest of my time today to offer a caution against turning this explanation into a justification. Let me be clear, explanation is not justification. It does not mean that within the context of the 19th century's fraught racial culture, Latter-day Saints had no other choice but to abandon the open racial attitude that animated the faith's first two founding decades and stop ordaining black men to the priesthood and stop allowing black men and women into its temples. Let me say it again, explanation is not justification. I'd like to share with you some of my current research in the eight, uh, on the 1852 territorial legislative session to illustrate my point. It was at this session of the legislature that Brigham Young first openly articulated a race-based priesthood restriction in Mormonism. Thus, 1852 is a crucial turning point in the Latter-day Saint racial story. The Utah Territorial Legislature, in fact, passed two laws that legislative session which held deep implications for matters of race in Utah Territory and in Latter-day Saint theology. The All Mormon Legislature passed a black servant code designed to regulate white slave masters who had brought their black slaves to Utah Territory, and an Indian indenture bill designed to regulate the long-standing trade in Native American women and children, which predated the Latter-day Saint arrival in the Salt Lake Valley. Latter-day Saint apostle and legislator Orson Pratt argued against passage of both bills, an important point to keep in mind. Legislators had choices, and Pratt articulated two of them. Similar to gradual emancipation codes passed in several northern states in the wake of the American Revolution, Utah Territorial Legislators in 1852 enacted a form of gradual emancipation that freed no one then a slave. In Pennsylvania, for example, legislators enacted a gradual emancipation bill in 1780, which ensured that those then living as slaves would continue as slaves for the remainder of their lives. Children born to a slave mother after the passage of the Pennsylvania bill would become indentured servants to their white masters until they reached 28 years of age, at which point they would become free. As two historians of the Pennsylvania law concluded, it was a cautious document that protected the property rights of slaveholders and freed no slaves. As a result, 40 years after the law went into effect, the 1820 census still reported 211 slaves in the state of Pennsylvania, 
more than Utah Territory ever counted. <laughs> 20 years later, there were still 64 people held as slaves, even though Pennsylvania was long considered a free state in the political context of the day. Utah fit this pattern, a territory that enacted a form of gradual emancipation in 1852 that freed no and then a slave, but defined them legally as servants. Although Utah legislators did not specify, they did imply that the children of those servants born after the law was passed would be free. The law did not last long enough for that to play out in practice, however, so that it is difficult to tease out exactly what the legislature had in mind for the rising generation of servants born after the law was passed. The, Utah State, uh, the United States Congress resolved the issue in 1862 when it freed all slaves held then in U.S. territories, including those in Utah. The racial priesthood restriction, which Young first ar openly articulated to the legislature, however, was not subject to congressional repeal, but became increasingly entrenched in Latter-day Saint theology, so much so that it was only removed by divine repeal after 126 years. Understanding the nuances of this 19th century context does not automatically justify the choices legislators in Utah and across the North made to keep human beings in bondage against their will. Utah territorial legislatures were not trapped in a historical context somehow outside of their control. It is not an act of presentism, that is, superimposing present-day values and understandings on the past to hold those legislators accountable for their choices. People in the 18th and 19th centuries regarded slavery as immoral and evil and acted on those recognitions to free their slaves. Immediate emancipation was an option, as was individual manumission. Territorial legislators in Utah could have concluded that Utah territory was de facto free soil, and in the absence of a positive law enacting slavery, the slaves then in the territory were free. They had that option and Orson Pratt vehemently encouraged his fellow legislators to choose it. Pratt called slavery a great evil and wanted the legislative council, warned the legislative council that if they permitted slavery in Utah territory, they would be under greater condemnation than a slaveholder in the South who inherited his slaves because they would be authorizing slavery in a territory where it did not already exist. Shall we introduce this evil in our midst? Pratt queried. No. I hope there is wisdom, light, and intelligence enough within the bosoms of this honorable council to spurn the idea with indignation. Far from being trapped by historical circumstances, legislators chose to perpetuate a system of unfree labor. They could have spurned the idea with indignation, as Pratt urged, but they chose bondage and white supremacy instead. Pratt was on the right side of history, a fact he attempted to make clear to his fellow legislators. Slavery was on its way out across the globe, and he shuddered at the thought of sanctioning it in Utah. When in our situation we are legislating in the capacity of people who desire to serve God, in the capacity to be, in the capacity to be the most benefit to the nations abroad, is it not known to this honorable council the light in which slavery is looked upon by almost every enlightened nation or heathen? They look upon it with disgust. Pratt here alluded to the fact that the British Empire had abolished slavery in 1833, although it compensated slaveholders, designated former slaves as apprentices, and established two stages for the abolishment of their servitude. Pratt urged his fellow legislators to join the international trend toward freedom. Wherein can it be expedient for us to suffer slavery to come into this territory when we can avoid it, he wondered. Shall we hedge up the way before us by introducing this abominable slavery? No, my voice shall be against it from this time until the bill shall pass, if you are determined to pass it. Although legislators made several important revisions to the bill that Pat wanted, Pratt wanted rejected, they were ultimately determined to pass it. As Pratt contended, it was enough to cause the angels in heaven to blush. In the end, the Utah Territorial Legislature passed the Servant Code over Pratt's objections. That does not mean, however, that his argument fell on deaf ears. The Servant Code, in particular, emerged from the legislative session in a crucially modified form, likely as a result of Pratt's strong voice of opposition. The original version of the bill stipulated that, quote, the master or mistress or his, her, or their heirs shall be entitled to the services of the said servant or servants and his, her, or their children until the curse of servitude is taken from the descendants of Canaan, unless forfeited as here and after provided. The final version of the bill, which passed 
and Tilah drop the key phrase, and his, her, or their children, until the curse of servitude is taken from the descendants of Canaan. In the absence of that phrase, the law that passed eliminated the perpetual nature of the bill and made it into a form of gradual emancipation. Similar to such gradual emancipation laws previously enacted in the free states of Pennsylvania and New Jersey. Even though Pratt did not win his debate with Brigham Young over the servant code, in the longer in the longer arc of history, excuse me. Um, Pratt has clearly been vindicated. Wherein can it be expedient for us to suffer slavery to come into this territory when it can be avoided, he argued? It would not be a sin to keep it out. Why, it would give us a greater influence among the other nations of the earth, and by that means save them. Shall we hedge up the way before us by introducing this abominable slavery, he wondered? It was a probing question that now bears the weight of 166 years of history. It was also a question which Mormonism is only now beginning to reckon with, 40 years after the lifting of its racial priesthood and temple restrictions. My discussion of the debate between Young and Pratt has focused on slavery, not priesthood, and I've done so for a purpose. In the various talks I've delivered on race and Mormonism over the past three years, I've never encountered an audience member who has defended Young's stance on slavery. But I continue to meet people who defend his position on priesthood. Why is that? It is easy to recognize that Young was wrong in his defense of slavery, but why do Latter-day Saints sometimes struggle to acknowledge that Young was wrong in implementing a priesthood ban in the very same speech? Consider these three different lines from Young's 5th of February, 1852 speech. Quote, we just as well make a bill here for mules to vote as Negroes or Indians. We cannot find within men upon the earth who are the seed of Cain any that possess knowledge and sensibility enough to vote. Number two, quote, What we are trying to do today is to make the Negro equal with us in all our privileges. My voice shall be against it all the day long. Number three, if there never was a prophet or apostle of Jesus Christ spoken before, I tell you, this people that are commonly called Negroes are the children of Cain. I know they are. I know they cannot bear rule in the priesthood in the first sense of the word. Why do Latter-day Saints sometimes try to justify and defend number three while they tend to be repelled by one and two? Sentence three is grounded as much in white supremacy as one and two. Perhaps Latter-day Saint leader President Gordon B. Hinckley asked the better question in 2006. How can any man holding the Melchizedek priesthood arrogantly assume that he is eligible for the priesthood, whereas another who lives a righteous life but whose skin is of a different color is ineligible? What Hinckley's question helps us to see is that prior restrictions were based on arrogant assumptions grounded in racism. New attempts to justify the prior restrictions, no matter how well-meaning, are therefore arrogantly assuming that a white man was eligible for the priesthood, whereas another who lived a righteous life but whose skin was of a different color was ineligible. Every justification is grounded in the same arrogant assumption. In 1852, Young admitted in his debate with Pratt, I may vary from others, and they may think I am foolish and short-sighted. Even still, he said, I know I know more than they do. From the vantage point of the 40th anniversary of the June 1978 revelation, Young was indeed foolish and short-sighted, and Pratt proved to know more than Young did. For us to bind the African because he is different from us in color is enough to cause the angels in heaven to blush, Pratt warned. Let me make my conscience to be clear from this, Pratt concluded, in a sentiment that might better represent the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints plea in 2018 than it did his own appeal in 1852. Thank you.
this morning for this wonderful occasion. Thank you for that. I'm a little tall. Thank you. Um, I bring you greetings from the John C. Danforth Center on Religion and Politics in St. Louis, Missouri. I'm very happy to be here again. I want to thank the Maxwell Institute and Spencer for having me uh, this morning. I grew up in the uh, holiness tradition within the Protestant church and, and hadn't really had much interaction with Latter-day Saints growing up. Um, I was born in the late 70s, let me be clear, the very, very, very late 70s. <laughs> and my mother had only told me one thing about Latter-day Saints and that was that, that they were not very fond of black people. I remember the first time that I had ever encountered a Latter-day Saint. I was a junior in college at Anderson University in Anderson, Indiana, a school of the Holiness Movement, the Church of God. And these two young brothers approached me uh, as I was leaving my uh, apartment to walk to, to campus this morning, to walk to campus that morning. And they approached me and identified themselves as Latter-day Saints. And I remember that my first thought was my mother's voice is that. Why are you Why are you talking to me? Right. I, I I know that already that you are not very fond of African Americans, and they shared with me that that had all changed and that was all in the past. And so, reading these two papers and responding to these papers brought all that back to mind, and about how we think about both as scholars and members of various faith communities think about this shift within the Latter-day Saint community. So I think both of these papers, and I'll, I'll be very brief because I want to make sure we have time for Q&A, but I think both of these papers, I think, answer this question. And I've sort of framed it by how do we think about race and this issue, both in terms of a biological determinism or as a social construct, right? Is race something that is biologically determined or as Graham Russell has told us, something that is eternal or is it something that is socially constructed? So in Professor Reed's paper, I think we see a great example of the uh, four C's of history. How do we think about history? He offers us uh, a narrative of change. He offers us the context, causality, and contingency. Mainly, in this last point on contingency is that the Latter-day Saints, he argues, had different sorts of choices they could have made. But they made certain kinds of choices at a certain place at a certain time for various reasons. So the one question that I maybe perhaps I would like, I think, for us to think about is what do we make of this history that Professor Reeve has laid out for us? One question that came to mind, if I could be so presumptuous to offer a question before the Q&A to get the jump, is perhaps what do we think about this history in light of the controversy that's been going on as it relates to naming, naming of buildings and monuments. Um, many of you may be familiar with the story uh, at Yale University, there was a controversy about renaming a dormitory, a residential college, after John C. Calhoun. And the university brought together a group of historians and a group of scholars from across their university there and came up with a rubric about how to think about whether or not buildings, names, and monuments should be changed. And one of, the, one of the facets of that rubric was this idea of contingency. Was the particular issue that the person was, that the person was known for, was that issue controversial in their time? So what we have here, perhaps Professor Reeve can answer for us, right? is that we know that this was a controversial issue at the time that you've laid out for us. So how do, we, how do we maybe think about buildings and monuments, perhaps, with this history as it relates to naming, moving forward, whether it's monuments, buildings, and even universities? So maybe that's one question we think about. Now, Professor Reeve ends the conversation about why, perhaps, is this issue often explained and justified, and I think Graham Russell's paper offers us one example of that. 
she shows that one of the one of the, the downfalls of trying to explain this through biology <laughs> that race is somehow biologically determined, right? That that's problematic and leads us to some very scary very scary places. Graham Russell then instead offers for us a number of things, including in uh, the wonderful editorial that she wrote with her advisor about this question of plotline, about the divine plotline and moving forward and how the divine plotline leads us to a community, to communities that are more egalitarian and equal. But the one question that I think that that raises for us about the this question of divine plotline, again, to get the jump, is perhaps how are we to make sense of that as it relates to the divine, especially those of us who have been kissed by the sun or those of us who are people of color? What are we to make of that, about what the divine thinks of us if we think about the divine plot line? Is this something that perhaps the divine wanted for people of color to be subjugated or marginalized? And if people of color have always been convinced of their equality, what are they then to do as they wait for the divine plot line to unfold for those in power? Another question perhaps maybe for us to consider is how do we think about this moment in its history as it relates to things that we might call soft racism or everyday racism or microaggressions. I think most of us would be appalled in this room to think about our faith or any of our commitments being aligned with the alt-right or folks who want to engage in violence. I think most of us would be clear to dismiss that. But I want to put forward that maybe perhaps that's the easy task, right? The easy task is to simply say, well, of course we don't believe in violence and naming other people. But I think the tougher question, right, is about what about everyday practices that about racism? How does this history inform the way we think about everyday practices, hiring practices, right? Things for that nature. And finally, for I think for my more of a selfish question, if I could, um, given that my own research is on the FBI, I'm wondering if maybe perhaps any of our two speakers could think about how this, this research that both of you have done engages with American institutions, such as, I don't know, the FBI. <laughs> I'm wondering if we could maybe talk about that as well. So I want to thank both the uh, presenters for their papers, and I want to thank again the Maxwell Institute for having me, and I look forward to the time of question and answer. Thank you. Janan to come up and take a seat with Lerone here. Well, I'll invite, uh, as we kind of get some mics ready here, folks, I'll invite you with questions to line up here in this aisle. We'll have a mic for you in just a minute. This one. Um, I'll let um, Paul and Janan, you and, and Laurel, you can pass that one between the two. Why don't we let Janan and Paul respond to Dr. Martin's uh, questions if you'd like, and that'll give time for people to come here. If indeed anyone comes here. Yeah. Good. Go ahead and address any of the questions that Laurel. Is this on? Yeah, okay. Uh, in, in just a minute, let, 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 we're going to let Paul respond to, to Lerone's question first, and then we'll, we'll come to the question here in a minute. So I'm hesitant to come from the University of Utah to Brigham Young University and uh, talk about names of universities. <laughs> Thanks for that question. <laughs> uh, 
you know, um, I, I address it in, in the book, uh, Brigham Young in 1847. So I, I don't see Brigham Young as inherently racist, right? Um, but certainly what he said was transcript racism in 1852. I should point out that in 1847, he's on record with an open racial attitude. And so we see a transition in Brigham Young's thinking about race from 1847 to 1852. He talks about, uh, we don't care about the color in 1847 to William McCary, a black Latter-day Saint, who is complaining about the way he's being treated amongst uh, fellow Latter-day Saints at winter quarters. Um, and uh, when McCary says, well, I don't have uh, a position of power within uh, the Latter-day Saint tradition, Brigham Young refers favorably to a black priesthood holder. He uh, refers to Q. Walker Lewis, who is a black man ordained to the Melchizedek priesthood in a low Massachusetts branch, says, we have one of the best elders, an African, in Lowell, a barber. Uh, and he's giving uh, basically the profile of Q. Walker Lewis. Uh, so he's referring in 1847 favorably to a black priesthood holder. Uh, so we also have to understand the complexity of his own evolving position. Um, now, after he stakes out his position in 1852, he doesn't deviate from it. He uh, uses the curse of Cain as his explanation for the priesthood restriction and never deviates from it. Um, sticks with that for the rest of his life. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I think there are uh, implications and we should think through them and we should be aware that that's a part of the Latter-day Saint racial story and uh, understand that there is a capacity for good and bad in all of us and understand what that means when we uh, pick names. So um, I, I'm right there with you. There are implications. Uh, and I don't think Latter-day Saints have done a great job of thinking through those implications, understanding the depth of the kind of racism that Brigham Young expressed in 1852. And we will be publishing all of those speeches um, so that they are publicly available. Uh, and we've gone back to the Pittman shorthand version, uh, trying to get at the original words um, that, that, as close as we can to the original words that, that Brigham Young expressed in 1852. Paul, can you give us publication information? When is that volume going to be available, and uh, what, what press is it coming from? So, uh, we don't have a press yet. Um, University of Illinois Press and University of Utah Press have both expressed interest. Uh, we're trying to, it, it's a documentary history of the 1852 Territorial Legislature. It will include Orson Pratt's speech, which had never been transcribed from Pittman shorthand. It will include Orson Spencer's speech, as well as uh, an entire debate on the Indian indenture bill that had never been transcribed. Uh, and contextual information. Um, and we're hoping 2019, by the end of 2019. Um, thank you for your questions. Uh, I have a lot to think about. Um, when you brought up this idea of the divine plot line, um, I think about this. There's a book called The Prophetic Imagination by Walter Brueggemann, um, and he talks about for the, the he takes the story of the Exodus. Um, he starts with the Egyptians, and he he talks about um, sort of the Egyptians' way of life and their way of thinking was that this way, this system, this slavery, this oppression was going to last forever, that their gods were going to last forever. And God, through Moses, um, presented an alternate alternative history to the Israelites and it presented the uh, Egyptians with this concept of death. So not necessarily physical death, but the death of these systems of oppression. And I see the same thing when I think about whiteness and white supremacy. Um, in the sense that white supremacy, colonialism, imperialism, all these oppressive systems, uh, there's this belief that they all, they've always existed and they will continue to exist. Um, and I think for black people and people of color, um, we exist as sort of that alternative to that, like, that notion that white supremacy is going to always exist. And I think we, we I, I often think, of, since I'm talking about space and matter and everything like that, we often, when we look, we think about space, we think about this vast sort of darkness, this blackness, but then we, when you actually think about what's in space, 
It's full of life, it's full of creation. And I think about that in the same way as I think of black people, that that thinking about this divine plot line, like the universe, this blackness, is that it's always expanding, and it's full of life, it's full of creation, and it exists as the alternative to sort of the, of white supremacies, the lies that white supremacies tells itself. Hope that answers your question. <laughs> Very good. We'll turn now to audience questions, so we'll, please. I have a sociology background, and uh, I just wanted to uh, introduce my question by comment that my grandfather was the president of the LDS Church Mission in Chicago in the 1920s, when it uh, had a small branch that included uh, mainly white people, but a number of blacks who'd come north during World War I, joined the church, and he hadn't been there long when a uh, delegation of whites came and said, either they go or we go. And I thought to myself, I wonder to what degree the need for congregational harmony forced people to justify and come up with nonsense reasons to kind of keep People separate because they, you know, they wanted, they didn't want disruption. So, to what degree is the, do you see the church's position as one of, we've got to find harmony. We've got polygamy on our backs. We can't get anything else. So, could you react to that statement? And I, I would like to make one other comment about my mother. She was walking toward Columbia University when she was 20, 21, going to school. And there was a very interesting conversation going on behind her, very erudite, very, very intellectual. And she kind of slowed up so she could follow these two men as they were talking. She got to the corner and turned to go across Morningside, turned around, they were both blacks. And emotionally, she said, intelligence has nothing to do with race. Anyway, about the harmony thing, because you know, the Protestant congregations are still separated. Comment on that, would you? So, uh, the Century of Black Mormons Project illustrates some of the issues that you're articulating. Uh, so, uh, in 1909, uh, German Ellsworth, who was president of the Northern States Mission, wrote a letter uh, back to Salt Lake City and said, we have three black families in the Northern States Mission, one in Oshkosh, Wisconsin, one in South Bend, uh, Indiana, and one in Minneapolis, Minnesota. The problem is, uh, when our missionaries bring white investigators to these integrated congregations, the white investigators don't want to stick around and worship with black people. And so he said, I've instructed my missionaries to stop preaching in black neighborhoods. So you understand how Mormonism came to be known as a white church. It was a deliberate, orchestrated uh, effort to stop seeking out black uh, neighborhoods uh, to missionize amongst. Uh, he doesn't name the three black families in those three different states. We have identified and named all of them in our Century of Black Mormons project. They are now known. Uh, Nettie Kirchhoff uh, was a family member of the Oshkosh, Wisconsin branch. She became Sunday school secretary in a mixed race and mixed gender Sunday school presidency in Oshkosh, Wisconsin. Um, in all three of these locations, there are fabulous stories. Elijah uh, Banks in Minneapolis, Minnesota, uh, taught Sunday school in an integrated congregation. But right, when uh, white investigators uh, showed up, uh, they didn't want to worship in an integrated uh, congregation, and it's the height of American segregation. Uh, even in the North, these are all three Northern examples. Uh, so yes, there were deliberate, uh, <clears throat> deliberate decisions made. Um, when uh, Latter-day Saint uh, Marie Graves, who was baptized in Oakland, California, went to Atlanta, Georgia, and invited her friends, she found the church in Atlanta, Georgia, invited her friends in 1920 to come worship with her and introduce the gospel to her friends. 
the branch president came off the stand, invited them outside, and said, this church was built by white people, and you're not welcome. She said, I belong to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in Oakland. And she was told in Atlanta she was not welcome to worship there. Uh, so those experiences are a part of our racial past and a part of our racial history. And yes, we did uh, reinforce white segregation uh, de facto on the local level. And, you know, by choice, uh, we decided to stop cross-lighting in black neighborhoods. answer your question, I think the church is making a tremendous effort to sort of bring everyone together. Um, my question is, what does that look like? What does harmony look like? What does it look like to be one? Um, a lot of the work that I do, or the work that I am doing right now, is with uh, Haitians in South Boston. And um, my thesis is, or my dissertation, hopefully, I've, I've got five years, so I might change over the course of time, but is convergent as a, is, as a type of acculturation. And so I use sort of the, I look at the different tools that the, the LDS church uses um, to bring people into the church. And one of the things um, that I've been working on um, is looking at the use of the Fren of French language, the French language in this Haitian war. And if you know anything about the relationship between the French and uh, Haitians, it's a very strained relationship for a good reason. Um, so a majority of the uh, members in this ward, they speak Haitian Creole, but all of the curriculum is in French. And so when you think about sort of the differences between the languages, it's not just a language difference, it's also a class difference. It's a, it's a colonial, colonialist narrative. And so when I'm thinking of this idea of harmony, um, you know, we have these sort of you know, bringing, making sure all the hymns are going to be the same um, across across the world, um, the, the, curricular, the curriculum being in this, in this one language, even though people in this ward are speaking, they speak a different language, um, I see the church moving, the LDS church moving towards a sort of white American narrative. Um, and so that's, that's how I'm seeing this shift towards harmony. I guess. Um, so my question, <clears throat> going to try to see how I can word this. Um, so I've been thinking a lot about words and the historical and social political context of words and how that translates to actual violence. And also public memory and how we remember reflects or translates into how we believe and that perpetuates violence also. Um, I'm on the Squaw Peak Committee, and we've been doing historical research of the word squaw and how um, we've been trying to rename that peak and how by having that physical representation of that word and still having that word used, it, it perpetuates actual violence where Native American women are the most likely to be sexual assaulted in Utah. Um, I'm in a Japanese internment capstone class where we talk about our public memory of what America has, has, has defined as relocation camps or evacuees instead of concentration camps and, and um, internment camps. So my question is here at BYU, I think about how the names and how we remember translates to actual violence to black students here. Um, how do you think that by keeping the names that we have, such as university named after Brigham Young, such as our administration building named after Abraham Smith, who was a prominent slave owner, such as George Buchanan, who said really racist things about black members of the church. How does that affect the way in which we remember or which we engage and interact with blackness? Does it have an effect on the way that BYU interacts with black students when we, to a point in which we don't feel like we belong here. Thank you uh, for your question. I, I, won't, um, I won't pretend to know all the ins and outs, but I can say from what I've um, studied about how 
institutions are handling this, I think one option, that oftentimes you only hear two, two sides, right? One side saying, just completely take it down, remove, and the other side saying, no, you know, you can't change history. I mean, I'm actually in favor of not taking down um, uh, old Confederate um, monuments or things of that nature, or things that have a sort of long history in this country of racism. What I am in favor of, which I think is actually educational for the public and not just for um, institutions of higher learning, is actually contextualizing these things, right? Putting them in the context. So, for example, you, you may have a statue of a Confederate soldier or, or, or a, a memorial. Part of that memorial needs to also include, right, about slavery. But that was actually what um, the economy was based upon. So we need to just tell a whole, a whole story, right, as opposed to simply trying to remove it and wipe it away as if it never happened, because I also think that's violence, right? If we just kind of remove things from our past that are, that are, that are not pretty and that do not comport with current day ideas of morality, I think you have to contextualize them. And I think there's a number of ways that can be done from plaques to educational tours, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that's what, what I'm in favor of about thinking about how to contextualize these sorts of things to, to address you, to your question. Yeah, I, I actually concur with that. I, I think the problem is just uh, um, without the context, without um, the more complicated narrative, um, it, it can produce the kind of uh, message that you suggest. Um, and so that, for us to be able to grapple with the complexity of uh, the human beings that, uh, you know, whose names are on the buildings and, and statues around the campus, right? Uh, um, so are there ways that the campus can think about and once again, I'm hesitant coming from the U to suggest what should happen at BYU, right? Um, but those are conversations that can happen at, and I think should happen at BYU, right? Um, are there ways that you can also acknowledge uh, the fact that slavery uh, was condoned uh, by Brigham Young and Abraham Smoot was uh, a slaveholder? Uh, and can we tell a more complicated story around the people whose names uh, are on the buildings at BYU. And at the University of Utah, I mean, I'm not um, <laughs> dismissing anyone from this. Um, it, it's a conversation that should be happening. I'll uh, add an editorial note here, too, that Paul Reeve holds a degree from Brigham Young University. <laughs> we still claim Paul Reeve. Yes. Next question, please. Paul has already partially answered my question. Um, I recently became aware of Jean, Le Jean Carruth and uh, Garrett, Garrett Dirkmont's uh, use of, of the Pittman shorthand retranscribing what was said by Brigham Young and others in, uh, in the legislative sessions. And so I was wondering, what to what degree will that influence how we seem to be moving towards pretty much, you know, uh, marking Brigham Young as a racist. Well, his words that are being, you know, that George Watts probably changed to some degree. Will that come out in your publication, Paul? Will that shift how we're feeling about Brigham Young at all? Well, uh, you know, I can't predict how people will feel, but but um, the 5th of February speech is just drenched in racism. I mean, there's, I, I, those were three quotes, but the whole speech is. Uh, just drenched. Now, now, Watt did transcribe the speech in 1852 into Longhand himself, uh, uh, um, but that was never published in the general discourses. It was never published in the legislative minutes. Uh, it just sat in George Watt's papers. And so, uh, and even then, um, if you're familiar with Legene's work, uh, there are discrepancies between Watt's own transcription and the Pittman shorthand. And uh, Watt didn't transcribe some of uh, Brigham Young's statements, um, and so we are, yes, so going back to the original Pittman, um, I think will probably, if people read it, will surprise people, um, and it should surprise people, and people should be horrified by it. 
Um, the most frequently cited version of that speech is Wilfred Woodruff's version. Woodruff was an apostle legislator who captured the speech in longhand. He gets about 900 words of a 3,000 word speech, and he gets things importantly wrong. Uh, and you can imagine trying to write down in longhand versus um, George Watt, who was captured in, in shorthand. Uh, and so in our publication, we'll have uh, the, the Pittman shorthand version that Logenius transcribes in parallel column with George Watt's own transcription of his version, in parallel column with Wilfred Woodruff's uh, longhand version. And so people can read across columns uh, the various iterations, and we think the Pittman version is the version that we should start using, and it's the most complete, it's uh, the most unvarnished, and it's Brigham Young in a very raw form. So my name is Alice Haney, and um, I'm from Virginia, Mount Vernon State, and I'm a daughter of Billy Johnson. Um, I know what you talk about. I knew about um, Brigham Young long before, and you'd be surprised to know that my father named my brother, the one after me, Brigham. And uh, about nine years ago, my father was living with me in New Jersey. He was sick, and uh, I had a lot of time to ask him questions. And I said, Dad, why did you name Kwame after Brigham Young, knowing all the things that he did? And then he looked at me and he said, I want him to know that when it comes to spirituality, you have to make sure what you are saying is right. Because what you say will have eternal consequences. And he said, Brigham Young will stand before God and answer those questions. And my father was a seer, so I believed him. In my calling in the stake, I am the African group leader. Mount Vernon State, we have over 280 African members, and most of them have been inactive. So my calling for the first, um, last five years had been reactivation and also organized activities to include both Africans and um, American members. My observation right now is it's not only the blacks that are suffering now, the whites also. They feel that they have wronged the blacks or the African descent. Because I organize events and I invite them. I stick everybody knows me. I invite them, but it's so hard for them to come to African events. The state is working so hard, but I can see that this particular problem is holding not only the blacks, but also the white people to open up. So my question is, at a point, is the church going to be openly announce that he got it wrong? Because spiritually it's still affecting people. Um, thank you for your question. Um, it's, it's one that I've thought about a lot. And people often ask me, do you think that the LDS Church will ever apologize for bringing them comments. Um, I think between the priesthood restrictions and the um, sort of the history of quote unquote Lamanites are some of the LDS Church's original sins. And to apologize for that would undo a lot of things and that's why this past a couple months ago there was a hoax letter that came out and um it was sort of this like apology for uh for the restrictions and everything and then you know a couple i remember it got posted online and then a couple of moments later you realized that there was a, it was a fake and so you know a lot of uh, specifically black members who were pretty devastated um by not only what was said but the fact that it wasn't real um but i think for the LDS Church to apologize would do, undo a lot of what the LDS Church is founded upon, which is sort of this infallibility, fallibility of, of, of the prophets. Um, and so if, if they were to admit that Brigham Young, or to say that Brigham Young was wrong, that other things could be called into question. Um, so no, I, at this time, I, I 
do not believe that the Adventist Church will be able to apologize, I mean, perhaps in the way that people would hope that they would. So I think the 2013 essay has a condemnation of all racism, past and present. Um, I think that was uh, as far as they were willing to go in 2013. It's difficult to predict uh, the future. Uh, I, I do want to respond to, uh, it was such a, a beautiful notion about uh, your, your father naming your, your brother Brigham. Um, the other, the other um, thing that um, is sometimes perplexing to me is when I encounter people who immediately start to circle the wagons around Brigham Young when we start to deal with uh, his racism as expressed in 1852, and there's an immediate sense sometimes that I get that people are circling the wagons and uh, somehow need to defend him, and it goes to the point that, that Janan just made uh, the point of prophetic fallibility and uh, Latter-day Saints um, struggle uh, with that issue and I understand that but Mormonism has a profound doctrine of eternal progression and people seem to want to trap Brigham Young in 1852 and stick their ground around his position in 1852 because he was a prophet and he said it, therefore. And they're failing to allow Brigham Young to progress eternally. Is he somewhere in the eternity stuck on his position in 1852? If Mormonism has a doctrine of eternal progression, can we allow Brigham Young to progress in the eternities? I think he wants Mormonism to move well beyond his position in 1852. And so the sense of circling the wagons um, just doesn't really add up to me if you factor in Mormonism's own doctrine of eternal progression. Uh, I, I don't see him somewhere in some dark corner of the eternities uh, upset uh, that Mormonism is moving forward. In fact, I. I see him as uh, trying to move Mormonism forward on racial issues. Uh, his own repentance bound up in that process. And so let's let him progress eternally. Uh, Paul, with that in mind, then I'm going to ask you a question. Do you think then it is correct for us in 2018 as academics to refer to him as a racist? Or do you think, do you think uh, the, the term racism has a context, and is a context of 1852? Then the second question I'd like to ask for my panel um, is, uh, have we moved as Mormons, I'm oh, sorry, I, I, I repent, as members of the Church of Jesus Christ, what I say, do you think that um, we have gotten rid of whiteness? I, 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 li I live in South Africa. Uh, in a very racialized society. Do you think that we have moved away from this label of Mormonism as being a white church? Just, just two questions, thank you. So, for the, for the first question, uh, I, I don't think it's wrong, uh, even in an 1852 context, to label what Brigham Young said as as racism and as racist. Because within that same 1852 context, Orson Pratt is actually advocating in that legislative session for black voting rights. And scholars have not included that as the context for Brigham Young, some of the things he says in that 1850, 5th of February 1852 speech. And it only makes sense if you understand they're also debating the voting rights bill. And Orson Pratt, has argued for black voting rights. And Brigham Young says they will not, black people will not rule over me in this church, meaning they won't have the priesthood, and they will not rule over me in this territory, meaning they won't have the right to vote. And that very afternoon of the 5th of February, Orson Pratt pushes back again against Brigham Young. He votes against two very innocuous municipal incorporation bills. City, Cedar City and Fillmore, their incorporation bills, these are just rubber stamp bills. And Orson Pratt votes against them. And the legislative minutes say he does so because they don't allow black people to vote. 
That's the afternoon of Brigham Young's speech that Brigham Young had given that morning, where he's saying, they won't rule over me in this territory, and they won't rule over me in this church. So uh, it's not wrong, in my estimation. It's not presentism, because people in the past, in 1852, were articulating an open racial attitude, and Brigham Young rejected Orson Pratt's vision, and Orson Pratt's call for black voting rights in Utah Territory. So, in that context, it's not wrong to label what Brigham Young participated in as racism, in my estimation. And then, um, I spoke too long, and I forgot the second question. <laughs> oh, is it still, still a white, white church, whiteness? I think we're still definitely grappling uh, with that. I think it's still very much a part of who we are, and we haven't um, fully reconciled with it, I guess is my assessment and my estimation. Uh, I, I think certainly the I'm a Mormon media campaign, and I know I said Mormon, but that was the official campaign, <laughs> uh, right, um, was an effort to claim a, an international and racially diverse identity for uh, the church. Uh, and so I think, um, at least in terms of public perception, uh, there is an effort to try to overcome uh, the whiteness uh, label. But it takes more than a public perception campaign to overcome some of the sy systemic kind of aspects of Mormon culture and doctrine uh, and leadership and all of those kind of things. So I don't think we're uh, there yet. I think it's still a part of it, and, and I think we have to recognize the power that whiteness played in our own history. And I hope that when Latter-day Saints can understand that as white worshipers in the 19th century, they were branded as racially different, they can understand that. If it can happen to white people, then my goodness, it can happen to anybody. Can we start using that as a process for standing in positions of empathy? Using our own racialized history to stand and mourn with those who mourn. It's part of how we identify as Latter-day Saints. It's part of who we are, who we pretend to be. And yet, we still uh, tend to separate out uh, I'm speaking of an American context. I'm not familiar with your context in South Africa to the same degree, but we tend to separate out uh, when racial violence happens in America. Uh, our black brothers and sisters might be experiencing that in a very different way than we are. And they come to church and they hear no one even pray about it or talk about it or suggest that anything is wrong at all. And so until we get over uh, sort of our... our our white security, I'm not sure that we're there yet, and I still think we do have uh, that whiteness problem. Well. Um, I definitely agree with a lot of what Paul said. <laughs> um, I guess what else could I say as a, as a black member of the LDS church and you know, feeling that sometimes that loneliness when you were walking around the hallways and all of the paintings are a white Christ or all of the people who are, you know, who are have clothed or are, are, have darker skin. Um, and there are other examples of the artwork in other places and that are holy places we find uh, are considered to be holy places. Um, so I think, yes, whiteness is very much a part of the church and is, is yet to divest from that. Um, <coughs> But I'm interested to see how the church moves forward. Um, we've seen a lot of new initiatives from President Nelson, um, First Presidency, the Quorum of the Twelve. Um, we went on a world tour. Um, and so I hope President Nelson listens to the things that he heard while he was going on in the world. So. Thank you. Thank you uh, profoundly, folks who have spoken in this session. Um, I'll close this session with just uh, a marker of uh, God's goodness and grace. Uh, this is atypical for an academic to close a session this way, but 25 years ago, 
I was a missionary assigned to Mount Vernon State, sister. And uh, two of the first three folks I baptized were from Africa. Will you please find them? <laughs> I'll come if I need it. <laughs> let's, let's find them. Um, uh, that was beautiful and sweet for me. Will you all join with me in a round of applause for our panel? take about a 10-minute break and start promptly at 11 for our next session. Thank you all.